What's good kings and queens, hope everyone's doing alright. Since we did a video on the most hated, this video is on the most respected people in boxing. With that being said, let's start the video. Darnell Boone is like the MF Doom of boxing. He's low-key your favorite boxer's favorite boxer. He's one of the hardest working guys in the industry. This man delivers, and that's why he kept on getting quality fight after fight. Three years and some change, this man had 22 fights. Two-thirds of that 22 were against blue chip prospects. Andre Ward, Enrique Anelius, Lahan Simon, John Pascal, Curtis Stevens, Jesus Gonzalez, and Brian Vera. Boone would take a short break in 2007 and come back back in 2009 and this man went to work fighting Craig McGuinn one month later, Eris Landy Lara two months later, Edwin Rodriguez a couple months later Brandon Gonzalez then 25 days later knocks out Adonis Stevenson. A win, but officially a draw against Lennox Allen, then the controversial loss against Sergey Kovalev. This man's 2009 and 2010 schedule was insane. Boxing has many roles. Boone knew his duty and he excelled. His duty was to test blue chip prospects to see that they have what it takes to move up to the world stage. There really should be a special place in the Hall of Fame for these type of fighters. They are the unsung heroes of the sport. They are the backbone of boxing when it comes to creating world champions. The personality, the humble beginnings, and what Hagler had to do to be finally accepted by the mainstream media gained the respect by many. While other fighters didn't have to do much to get the limelight, Hagler had to do double, if not triple, to get where he is in the sport. To where he's on late night shows, Saturday Night Live, when it was good. And finally, when you ask where you are, say Las Vegas, and you'll probably be right big commercials and even international movies. Says we're gonna crash it. What am I, an idiot? Is this the same guy that we rescued from Jack Benet some time ago? Keep in mind, this was during a time when being bald wasn't popular from a big corporate marketing perspective. Speaking of, speaking of your head, how, how often do you, do you... Don't start like Johnny Carson. Where do your forehead ends? No, 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 no. But do, okay. how often do you shave your, your head? Wait, man, I gotta make sure you got all yours too. So this is really a hell of an achievement to be part of. One of the many centerpieces of American pop culture. Deplorable. I'm speaking of offending in the personal grooming arena. Something I would of course consider quite beyond the pale. So I give you a new Red Guard sports stick, antiperspirant and deodorant. Marvin is the perfect example of being a boogeyman, but also having the perfect balance of flash and charisma that wins the hearts of many fans. This is it all with you? I don't believe so. You know, I got power on both hands, you know. One is K, the other one's O. Yeah. You know, this one don't get you, that one will. You know? <laughs> You guys wouldn't go out to dinner together, um, and even though you're gonna fight. Well, you or know, they like told that. me you're making 21 million. After I finish with him, I might come after you. <laughs> Over the years, there's been many boogeyman figures in the sport, but they lack both categories that would have elevated them in and out of the sport of boxing. To be honest, I never heard a single bad thing about this guy. He's low-key been in boxing for many years and didn't really get into the spotlight till the 2010s. I personally worked on a couple projects with Tom. I can say he's a classy dude. My opinion, Tom plays a very massive role in bringing light to the lower weight classes on a mainstream level. Tom acquired in a joint partnership with Taken Promotions to undefeat Roman Gonzalez right at the peak of his career after Floyd's retirement putting Roman at number one in the pound for pound rankings. All eyes were on Gennady Golovkin who Tom promoted. Tom took a couple pages from the 90s when Chavez was fighting. Chavez had Ricardo Lopez fighting on his undercards. Since this was the golden age in the lower weight classes with the right promotional push it will be a hit and it sure was. Chocolatito's not an American. This is where the audience is. Can he do the same thing for the lower weight classes that Carvajal did? 
He does some spectacular things. So much of a reminder of the great late Alexis O'Grill. Gonzalez would put up an amazing HBO debut as a co-main to Golovkin Monroe. Anyone care that they're flyweights? Not at all. That's some heavyweight action right 100%. there. 100 percent That's the way to fight. Any questions, American boxing audience? Roman's popularity will quickly gain to where Roman would have a card of his own, complemented with fighters from the lower weight classes, getting the spotlight of their own in the undercard. This would attract world-class two-division champion Naoya Inoue. He will make his US and HBO debut in Tom's Superfly event. Due to the major success, this motivated the then-retired three-division champion Kazuto Ioka to come out of retirement. He would also fight on Tom's Superfly 2 card. Superfly 2 or Los Angeles day. 見た Afterwards, Yoko will put up a Hall of Fame caliber career, becoming Japan's first four division champion. Due to the hidden gems Tom unearthed on the mainstream stage, this helped set up the Bantamweight tournament on a far larger level than the original one back in the early 2010s. This would become a massive success, turning Inoue into a huge star on the world level, becoming boxing's first fighter to be on the cover of Ring Magazine. This would also revive the career of Nonino Donaire, who was after the Frampton fight at the end of the road. Due to Tom's risk, he was able to make the lower weight classes highly lucrative, and he must get big props for this, because he started it all. I made a video on this man some years back called The Hardest Working Man in Boxing. Buck Smith is a definition of a full-time boxer. Not seasonal, not part-time, full-time. Buck started out as a boxing spectator. One of the fighters was a no-show, and the promoter got desperate and started offering spectators money to fill in for the no-show. Buck accepted it. Despite losing, this would forever change his life. Buck fought at the most ridiculous pace. He felt like the most physical damage takes place during sparring, so instead of risking getting getting injured in exchange for experience, which he doesn't really get paid for, he fought guys on an almost day-to-day, -day, week to week, month to month basis, who were the equivalent to a sparring partner. I've been fighting sparring partners. Well, it was a sparring session, but for you, not for him. Sean Gibbons, this has to be very rewarding for you guys. You run around the country in your Honda Civic, right? Right. All right. And taking these fights uh, in small towns, this is a good moment for Buck. Oh, yeah. Well, it's taken us, uh, you know, two years and 200,000 miles later to get back to Vegas. <laughs> this man will drive venue to venue all over the Midwest, raking up hundreds and thousands of miles annually on his Honda Civic. In 1989, the 22-1 Buck will lose his second fight against Olympic gold medalist Robert Mungila, who was 3-0 at the time. It's almost like this man went to the hyperbolic time chamber and gained 8 years experience in 2 years because Buck would rake in 70 fights in 2 years to earn a rematch against Robert. Uh, the first time I fought him I was uh, a little bit unexperienced at the time because I had him hurt and had him down in the second round and couldn't put him away. I uh, couldn't follow up with anything but this time I believe I can follow up with everything that I throw at him now and uh, keep him down for good. The now more polished and experienced Buck would beat Wengila, stopping him in the second round. Some, some, oh, good hook by Buck Smith. And, and another, another yes. and another, and Wengila's in big trouble, and down he goes, out of the ring, somersault. Four. This fight will be over. Well, he stopped it, not That's it. Yeah, well stopped, well stopped. Well stopped. It was a lot sharper and a lot crisper this time than it was that uh, wide winging hook that I fought him two years ago. And you said that's what you've been working on. Is that the way you've been throwing that punch? Yes. Uh, for the last two years, I've been practicing on uh, sharpening it up and, and making it uh, connect, hit the right, pump, hit the right uh, spot. With the record of 124-2, and two, Buck made the IBF top five ranks. He would more than likely be in line for a title shot if he got past Kevin Pompey for the IBF USBA title, which is an important regional belt. Smith will come up just short and lose to Pompey. This will be the closest Smith came to a title contention. Command on your car, and I don't think you can argue with that. Buck Smith mocking Pompey, but Pompey at the same time. Whoa! Good right hand. Oh my! And that really hurt Pompey. And now this is the one moment for Buck Smith. He's got to do it all right here. This is it. It's all on the line right here because he won't win a decision unless he knocks Pompey out. And he's Man. letting Pompey catch a breath here. Give Pompey credit though. I mean, he was out on his feet. He is now.
he will continue to fight on regularly. He will finish up his career with a record of 183 wins, 20 losses, with 124 knockouts. Before we get back to the video, be sure to hit that like button to help the rest of the good old folks see the video. This video's comment section topic question is, what was your favorite year in boxing or MMA and why? Leave in the comments. Thanks for sticking around and let's get back to the video. Leroy Neiman is one of the most famous artists to contribute to the sport of boxing. His style is rather unique. He's an expressionist artist. He has painted a piece for almost every historic fight in boxing from the 60s onward to the 2000s. A lot of times he would be part of the creation of the official poster for the fight. For the people who always wondered who was that guy with the unique mustache and the background at big fights and, and even in boxing movies, that's him. Artwork was used for the Rocky movies as Leroy's original pieces go for a lot of money. This piece he made in 1969 of the great Sugar Ray Robinson is going for $42,000. Leroy's influence will live on and boxing for future painters. Now, some may have negative views based on a fan's perspective. Fabella is a fighter's first promoter. He looks out for what is best for the fighters and not for himself. That a young champion has the right to be protected by an organization and not made to fight the best fighter in his division or in the world. Who has, by the way, paid sanctioning fees to the WBC throughout his career, been loyal to the WBC, expect the WBC to do the right thing as it usually does. This man is your champion. This is the best middleweight in the world, and no one on the stands, and no one in no. the world thinks otherwise. No, sir, can you please sit down? No, you will not accept you to speak anymore. Please sit down. If not for him, we as fans would have never been able to see the full potential of the great Sergio Martinez. As Martinez was being treated wrong by the WBC, Lou fought the hardest for Sergio to get what he's entitled to. Always go back to his agreement, rest you and please. Unanimous. They do favors and favors and favors for the people that have Pacquiao and Mayweather. And Sergio, the best middleweight in the world, is an afterthought. And it shows you how uneven the playing field is and how television often can be part of the problem. I think when it came to the case of Jermaine Taylor, we saw Lou's true colors here. He really did his best to put Jermaine on the right path to glory. When Taylor hit rock bottom in his career, Lou was right there by his side, trying to give him every opportunity to keep him afloat, as well as trying to provide him with the help he desperately needs for his mental health, as Taylor was never the same after his loss against Arthur Abraham. Lou could have very well cut ties with Jermaine after 2015, when the Mora fight got canceled due to Jermaine's legal trouble but he still remained by his side. Now I'm not going to share the fighter's name but I did receive a fighter's experience with Lou who had an up and down career and hasn't gotten a fair shake on the business end by people above the promotion. He told me just as I assumed he was an advocate for the well-being of the fighter's mental health. He's a straightforward no BS guy that's not going to lead you on. He's willing to let you move up at your own pace and when you're ready to step it up and to be be thrown into the mix and make rank, he's more than willing to give his support. From what I've seen, if you don't take what you have been matched with, you'll get thrown on the shelf to collect dust. Seen it with veterans and even well-talented prospects. As far as promotions go, Lou is like the equivalent to the IBF. Straightforward, no BS, and those who are really hungry and want it will be rewarded indiscriminately. Neil Leifer is one of the greatest, if not the greatest, photographer not only in boxing but American sports history. Some of the most beautiful photography from various sports at the highest level of the game. He has captured almost every iconic boxing moment. Beautiful boxing portraits from the 1960s when he took as a teenager all the way to the 2000s. When it comes to vintage boxing color photography, the one thing that stands out from his is the color and clarity. Very fine grain which is almost non-existent to where it looks like a modern day photo beautifully preserved for newer generations to appreciate. I believe in these images, Neil was using his go-to camera, the Yashka Mat, which is a medium format film camera. It uses 56 by 56 millimeter film, far larger than your standard 35 millimeter. You have much more light and information coming through to where it will produce a fine image, like this one here, where you can zoom in so far that you can see a young Larry Merchant in the background and absolute all of what's happening. 
compared to using 35 millimeter film, which you're guaranteed to have medium to heavy grain because the lighting situation for these fights is not the best. Reasons why flash photography was so prevalent and acted in some cases as a fill light. Flash photography would be banned in boxing because, well, the obvious. I can't pinpoint the year it was banned, but it would have to been in the late 60s or so in certain states, but later nationwide, years later. Neil is now 80 years old. The last fight that I can find that he shot was Water Fury 2 in 2020. After being called a quitter and being told to retire from boxing by the press, Klitschko was considering retirement. It wasn't until both brothers received a letter from that former heavyweight champion Max Schmeling giving the brothers words of encouragement. Those words fueled them. Vitaly would leave everything on the line, including his eye against Lennox Lewis, earning the respect from many. After winning the WBC title, he was forced to retire due to an injury. After fully healing, Klitschko would come back and put on a Hall of Fame career, regaining the title in his first fight in over four years. He will make nine title defenses before retiring from the sport to pursue politics. During the Ukrainian Revolution, Klitschko is standing with his people during the worst moments of the protests. Vitaly would run for president but he would change his mind and decide to run for mayor of Kiev. He would win and be sworn in later in 2014, where he's still mayor to this day. Vitaly's efforts over the years and in current days of what's happening in Ukraine, with him being a massive political target as the mayor of Ukraine's capital. Klitschko did not flee and seek asylum, he remained with his people to defend his homeland. Klitschko would be awarded the Arthur Ashe Award for his bravery in 2022. Peter Buckley will be billed the worst boxer of all time by the media, which for me, I can't say that. I would say he's one of the hardest working boxers in the industry. Peter treated boxing as a full-time job. He understood his role as a fighter of his caliber. He did not overstep his boundaries and went on to be the best, most reliable guy out there. A guy a promoter can always rely on to test their young and upcoming fighters and give them the rounds they need to gain precious experience in the sport. As those fighters who faced him gave Peter the same level level respect to where they were fighting with the intentions of getting rounds in and practicing their craft. Perfect example, Peter went a full six rounds to a decision against Prince Nassim Hamed in 1992. Out of 256 losses, Peter was only stopped 10 times. As this is Peter's job to give fighters rounds and test them, in quite a bit of cases he did get robbed. Look at him, look who he boxes, look how he boxes, look how he looks after himself. Look at his face, he's not banged about, he looks very, very well. He's a very, very good professional. Peter would be awarded for his 200th fight, but his real goal was to hit 300 fights. Peter had faced them all. Despite getting of age, he was determined to get to 300 fights on his resume. May. He got to 299 fights by October 2008, losing to a six round decision to the future champion Lee Selby. For Peter's 300 fight, which will be billed as his final fight, a large crowd will be in attendance as he's facing Martin Muhammad. Standing ovation, everybody in the arena, including promoter Frank Warren. Peter would end his career with four round decision win, with the many that attended making this moment very special. The last hurrah. For Peter Buckley in the red trunks, and he lands with another left hook, and he's being cheered here as if he was in a world title fight, I tell you. He has won it, he has done it. Number 300 is a win. It felt great just to win in front of him, yeah, to go out as a winner. Hopefully, I'm going to stay in the game and uh, put what knowledge I've got to uh, train people. So, anyone listening, it's a job in the train. <laughs> Emmanuel Stewart is most famously known for training the great Thomas Hearns, making Lennox Lewis and Vladimir Klitschko into a Hall of Fame heavyweight, bringing in Tyson Fury and creating an insane amount of champions throughout his life as a trainer. Stewart was a fan favorite as he did not play into whatever narrative that the network was trying to push. He told things as it is, giving his honest observation. His opinion and predictions in boxing as a whole were on the level of Notre Dame. When he talked, people would be quiet and listen. His knowledge of not only the sport the business 
and the history was amazing to behold. Stewart will forever be submitted in boxing and his services in the community, keeping hundreds if not thousands of young delinquents off the streets in Detroit, teaching them the discipline of boxing. I never had any plans at all of being a big boxing manager or trainer. Most of my time was consumed with my career at Detroit Edison. I worked as a lineman about nine years. I was always still going to the gym in the evening as a hobby though. Boxers. Good. He left us too soon when boxing needed his voice the most, and he will forever be missed. What's your thinking about all this? Well, I think what we saw and heard is what we have. Sounded like Larry Merchant talking slow. <laughs> but I really think that uh, his son is the apple of this man's eye, and he loves his son. Such love I've never saw from a father. And I think sometimes his loves and his emotions just end up with uncontrollable outbursts verbally and that's just the way he is. And on top of that, this is the most respected people in boxing. For more videos like these, be sure to like, share, if you're new, subscribe. Subscribe to the Patreon for patron back projects and early access. This patron back project is on the tale of Floyd Mayweather versus Ricky Hatton. I'm Wolf Sancho and I'm out.